Okay, that big moment, that big moment where you became a Christian perhaps a little while ago and your parents weren't too happy, maybe, uh, but a fragile peace has basically been maintained, more or less, uh, and you'd just love to share Christ with them and all he's come to mean to you, you know, with your mum and your dad. Yeah. Are you with me so far? And then, months after this all happens, as you're driving along on a car trip with your dad, an opportunity to say something vaguely intended to open up a useful spiritual conversation arises. And you tentatively take that little step and you, you try it on a bit and you go, uh, uh, and your dad sees immediately what you're doing straight away. And he turns to you and says, son, I used to change your nappies. Can you imagine? Devastation. A sinking spirit. A, re a real reluctance to ever say anything to anybody ever again about the Lord. Can you imagine? Yeah. I confess to you, I was that boy. Okay. Heartbreaking. And mum came to trust Christ and dad, as far as ever we can know, never did. And that sort of experience, and lots of others can, like it, can leave... A Christian person asking his or herself, how can the gospel message that leaves as offended so many people, how can a, a, a message that offends so many ever be right and true? <coughs> that is the sort of situation that the Lord finds himself dealing with in today's passage in Mark chapter 6. He's been there too. He's in that situation too. Here's the context. This section of Mark's Gospel runs from 3.13 through to 6.6, the end of the passage we've looked at and Caleb's read for us this morning. At the beginning, you get the appointing of the 12 apostles. And the context for that is that Jesus has come proclaiming the kingdom of God, saying the kingdom of God is at hand, so repent and believe the gospel. Here's what's changed. The kingdom of God has come. So what you need to do, because the kingdom of God is coming in, while you've got the chance to do that, what you need to do is repent and believe the gospel. And, and, and then how do you show that? Well, that leads to following me. He goes and he says to all those, those guys fishing by the lake, so come and follow me. Repentance and faith leads to following Jesus. And how do you follow Jesus? He says, follow me and here's what happens. I make you fishers of men. So in this context, we've got the introduction of the announcement of the gospel. It's the kingdom of God is here, so wake up. Repent, believe. How do we express that? We express that by following Jesus. How do we express following Jesus? By going ourselves and becoming fishers of men. And then in 3.13, uh, Jesus appoints the 12 to sort of lead that going and being fishers of men. Lead that bringing people to, into the kingdom of God. And immediately, when those 12 are appointed and the, the gospel's going forward and the mission is kicking off, there's opposition from his family, his own family. And then there's opposition from these religious leaders who come down from Jerusalem. And then again, the family come back, they say, we'll take him away, he's out of his mind. <laughs> Common response from people who can't understand what's happening. Now up against that background, you then get these parables in 4 and 5. The parable of the sower is told against the context of opposition to the gospel going forward, of opposition to Jesus coming, preaching the kingdom of God. The parable of the sower explains for Mark's readership the Christians in Rome living there in that difficult place to be a Christian following Jesus and sharing your faith. The parable of the sower tells them what to expect when they try and share their faith with people. You expect some hard ground, expect the seed to bounce and the birds to eat it up. You expect some rocky ground where there's just not the depth. You haven't got the tilth of soil. And you get this sudden springing up. People, hey, enthusiasm, fantastic. And then persecution comes along. It's near Rome. The sun comes out and the plant withers. And then you get some who go, yeah, great, fantastic. But they haven't dealt with the things in their life that are weeds in their life. The seeds and the bits of root. You know, you do that when you do, you do veg. <laughs> you know, you, you turn your garden over, you, do, so you can talk to me, it's okay, so that's not a change. You, you, you turn the ground over and you haven't taken all those roots out and then quickly there's a weed that springs up and chokes out your lettuce. Maybe not your lettuce, but some things that grow slower. The parable of the sower is set against this background. And the parable of the lamp, because obviously if people are hostile to the gospel you're trying to bring to them, you, you, you are reluctant to put the gospel light on the stand and let it shine. 
You know, the fact that there are going to be shadows in the room is no excuse for not putting the lamp on the stand, is it? And then you lose confidence maybe because of all this experience. You lose confidence in the seed itself. You lose confidence in the word of God to do what it's there to do. And, and you, you begin to think, well, you know, nothing happens. I, I take the word out. I, I go to Sandalo show on a, on a show Saturday and I speak to all these people and nobody falls down and is saved. And you lose confidence in the whole thing. And Jesus says, well, hang on. There's this parable of the seed that grows secretly. When you, when you share your faith as a, as a Jesus-following fisher of men, you know, bear in mind, a lot of what's happening is happening below the surface. Yeah. And then there's the mustard seed. You've lost confidence in this thing. What can it do? Well, a tiny little thing that you do, a tiny little contribution of seed, leads to this dirty great bush in which the birds of the air, the wild birds, not the ones, the canaries, budgies. You have those? Do you have those in America? Budgie does. Do you have those? Crazy little things, aren't they? They live in a cage, not cage birds, the wild birds. Yeah. The guys in the mart on a Monday. Yeah. Those guys, come and find rest. So the power of the word is very clear, says Jesus, but the response that you get to the sharing of it as a follower of me, as a fisher of men, as one who's responded to the gospel of the kingdom can be mixed. Don't lose track of the fact that all these responses are, are biblical, are to be expected, are authentic, but they do not undermine the overall power of the word of God and go on sharing it. And having spoken to us about the power of the word, then there's the power of the Lord who speaks in his word. Lord over chaos in creation, the stilling of the storm. Lord over demonic forces in the universe, the driving out of the demons from that man, Legion. Power over, you know, debilitating sickness, the healing of the sick woman. And power over death, the raising of Jairus' daughter. Do not hold back. This is all authentic Christian experience. This is what the Lord is saying through Peter, who probably underlies it, and Mark, who writes it down, to the believers in Rome during Nero's era. Stick with this, sharing the gospel of the kingdom of God. And again, at the end of it, can you see there's sort of an inclusio? There's the opposition at the beginning of the section, there's the opposition at the end. It's like brackets around what's going on. Fresh today, we're into this bit about the opposition coming again from family and friends. You know, one of my weaknesses in, in preaching is that I, I, I know what I'm going to say, but I've got several pages with it written on, and then I've got to go and catch up. Uh, I've got to read a few pages. It'll be okay. Lunch is not going to burn. Um, it's fine. So Jesus goes back then to Nazareth in Galilee, to his hometown. Jesus left that place, chapter 6, verse 1, and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. He was invited to go preach in his home synagogue got to be good well he's been around the place healing the sick raising the dead and stopping the storm hasn't he driving demons out of people so you better come and listen let's find out what this boy's about then thinks he's a bit of a preacher let's have him in let's see what he's going to do and he comes in and we see what he does in his hometown nazareth about 20 miles west southwest of capernaum uh, where he grew up uh, so he's from nazareth but he grew up in this bustling uh, commercial center here where there's a fishing industry and everything going on Nothing much happens in the hills. Does that, does that ring true? Um, how busy is where you left today? <laughs> you know, he's gone home to Nazareth. He's gone home to, would you say, Hicksville? You know, he's gone home to this place in the sticks, right? Which many of us would relate to. Nothing much happens there. Um, we told he was a carpenter in Nazareth growing up, um, which is a bit of a, bit of a funny one because there's no trees in Nazareth. Um, but then you look a bit more into it and you find out the word that, that's used actually describes somebody who's a constructor of things. He's a useful guy. He's the guy who builds with stone. He's the guy who makes things. He's the guy who fixes the plough and fixes the, you know? He's that guy. And he's that in Nazareth, in Galilee. Back of beyond. You don't read much about Nazareth in the history accounts because Nazareth, nothing happens. Uh, nothing good comes out of Nazareth, okay? That's a bit like, uh, I could name some villages now, couldn't I, and get in terrible, terrible, awful trouble. But you know what I mean. Uh, there are these places. It's one of them. Several pages more. We don't need any more of that. Good, good. So he's gone back to this place where he has to minister close up and personal, looking in the eye, people who saw him growing up, saw him falling over and scratching his knee as a child. Did they have short trousers? Probably not. Um, but you know the sort of thing. 
Let's be clear what's happening here. He preached in front of those who were his closest people. And the effect of that, verse 2, many who heard him were astonished and they said, where did he get these ideas? What is this wisdom that's been given to him? What are these miracles that are done through his hands? Isn't this the carpenter? That's that word, you know, we just spoke about. The maker and the mender and the whatever. The son of Mary and brother of James and Joses and Judas and Simon. Aren't his sisters here with us? And so they took offence at him. You go to Ireland. Uh, I remember very clearly ages ago in a place called Clonmel, which is about three or four hours south of Dublin, I suppose, south, down there, on a long bus journey. Uh, being, being chatting with people, we'd taken a, a mission, we'd taken a few young people from our church, uh, new Christians and stuff, to do a mission with some people we knew there. And, and standing and somebody was saying to me, you know, talking about Mary, and it's all about Mary, and it's all about Roman Catholic stuff, you know, like that, and saying, look, you know, Jesus did have brothers and sisters, you know. No, 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 impossible, impossible. Well, actually, he did. Uh, it's in, it's here. Look. Um, and it was the beginning of conversation and contact. And oh, I didn't know that. Right? Here it is. He had brothers and sisters. They'd all grown up there in Nazareth or around Nazareth. And people are taking offence at Jesus because they think they know him. Now that's really important. They think they know him. We meet that all the time, don't we? People who think they know about Jesus. And he's got a few surprises. Way back at the beginning of this section, 3.20 to 21 and then 3.31 to 35, it is the Lord's closest family that oppose him for his ministry, try to write him off as being mad. And now here he is again at the end of this unit in Mark's Gospel with the people who have been closest, friends, neighbours, family, taking offence. And so they took offence at him and they dismissed him because they thought they knew him. Why? Well, the king comes to proclaim and inaugurate his kingdom and they take offence at him. You know it is in the UK, if, if a preacher upsets the congregation, you know what happens next, don't you? Gets his P45, okay? One way or another, they take offence at him, he's on his way. That seems to be the way it is. Oh, is it like that in America? It is, is it? Yeah. I'll just watch what I say. Uh, but, but this, you know, they take offence at Jesus and they won't have it. They won't have him. They won't hear from him. And that proclamation of the incoming kingdom of God is rejected because the messenger is discounted and the messenger is dismissed. Now, have you had that happen to you? It is authentic biblical experience. And if they did it to Jesus, they'll do it to you and me. I haven't heard a sermon say that before. I just thought it was worth saying because look, that's what it's there in Mark 6 to show us. What are they objecting to then? Where did he get these ideas? So they took offence at him. Where did he get his ideas? He's been preaching things of which they had been utterly unaware and they find it very innovative and previously unknown. Like, like, like the, the church deacon who says, Change? <laughs> we can't have that. Do you have the joke about the, uh, the Reformed Baptists? Uh, how many Reformed Baptists does it take to change a light bulb? Change? No, okay. Um, so, we know from elsewhere, don't we, that the Lord doesn't teach like the teachers they were accustomed to. He taught as one who had authority, not as their teachers of the law. The teachers of the law would all be saying, Rabbi such and such says this, Rabbi such and such says that, Rabbi, you know, human authority. And Jesus comes in and he says, you've heard that it was said, but I say to you. Because he has the authority to do that. So we'd have a very different style and a very different manner of presentation. But that's not quite what they're objecting to here, is it? What they object to is this teaching, these things, these ideas. Where did he get these things from that he's saying? The response to people is on, is on the content of Jesus' teaching. So these ideas was was sort of supplied in the text to make this clear. It says these things. They know him. They know his family, or so they think, because of his close life proximity to them. And they know that he is teaching things that don't come from proper rabbi school because he hasn't been to proper rabbi school. I have to confess, I did go to the modern-day equivalent of proper rabbi school, and that's great if you can. But Jesus didn't, and they take offence because of that. People say to you now, you know, oh, where did you train? They say to me, where did you train? 
and they're trying to work out whether you can possibly be any good or not. And frankly, if one is or is not, it doesn't depend on where one went to Bible college, let me promise you. The fact that Jesus didn't go to proper Bible college, they're taking offence. Where did he get these ideas from? Do you see the point? Unauthorised ideas. And they took offence at him. More than that, on top of not wanting unauthorised ideas, they didn't like the ideas themselves. What is this wisdom that's been given to him? Now, can you think of Luke's Gospel? Can you think of when Jesus went to the synagogue at Nazareth in Galilee in Luke's account of it? Luke's got a fuller account in some ways. We know from Luke's Gospel that Jesus went into the synagogue at Nazareth in Galilee, read the portion he was handed from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah about the Spirit of the Lord coming upon the Messiah to preach good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, and so on. Do you remember that? Jesus came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day as was his custom. He stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll, found the place where it was written. This is what he's saying. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and the regaining of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. What's he been doing in Mark's Gospel up until now? He's been doing the works of the anointed, the Messiah, the one that God would send to bring in his kingdom, bring salvation to Israel. And then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. Preachers sat to preach. Okay, so he'd read and he'd sit to preach. Now they're attentive. What's he going to say about that? The Romans are here. You know, the zealots are kicking off and trying to sort things out. And what's he going to say about that? Everybody's watching him. And then he began to tell them, today this scripture has been fulfilled even as you heard it being read. And then they said, according to Luke, isn't this Joseph's son? <laughs> hmm, how can this be? And they took offense at him because they thought they knew him and they didn't. Now think of those believers at Rome that Peter was getting Mark to write to. Not all of them were people who had been formally trained and received the sort of wisdom that this world respects. I guess most of their preachers weren't either. Great if you have, but they hadn't. And these people are being told that the preaching of the kingdom of God from the mouth of the king himself was also received in this way. What's this wisdom that's been given to him? What's this? And they took offense at him. Him. Persevere when they take offense at you. And then there's this third objection. What are these miracles that are done through his hands? And so they took offense at him. <laughs> you would have thought, wouldn't you, they'd have believed for the miracles. He's just stilled the storm on the lake. That's unusual. Stop slopping about immediately. I mean, fantastic. He's just, that, that man over in the, in the five cities, in the, in the ten cities, in the Decapolis, th th that man who was un uncontrollable. He cast demons out of him. He's just in his right mind and clothed, and he's telling everybody all about Jesus. You know, he suddenly turned preacher. What's going on? You'd have, you'd have thought they believe on the basis of the miracles. There's there's Jairus who's got a daughter back. You know, his his got his daughter back. Did I say her daughter back? Strange name, but it was a bloke's name. Uh, Jairus has got his daughter back, and there's the woman who's been you know, twelve years was it? Devastated, and she's healed. You'd have thought they'd believe for that. But, but they're objecting to Jesus on the basis of what he's done. Doing the acts of the Messiah. Doing what Isaiah prophesied the Messiah would do. They see these things happening, but they don't get it. They can't grasp the significance of what they're seeing Jesus do. They don't get it, so they don't believe it. But they've seen it. And failing to make sense of what they've seen, they have rejected it. Expect that. Expect that when people can't actually make sense of what they've seen, they take offence. They take offence here at the very signs of God's favour. But here comes the absolute clincher for them. Here comes the absolute clinching objection. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this the son of Mary? Look at the way they put that. Something going on in what they're saying there, isn't there? Brother of James, Joseph, Judas and Simon. A bunch of boys, aren't they? And aren't his sisters here with us? 
Read the subtext here. Carpenter. Mary's son. He's no better than us. He's no better than we know him to be, Carpenter. Mary's boy. We all know about her circumstances. We know them. We know his brothers and sisters. We know about him. And thinking they knew him, they took offence at his preaching of the kingdom of God. And they took offence at his preaching that he was its king. Peter, through Mark, is preparing his Roman readership to stand firm when people are offended by familiarity with themselves as they hold out the good news of the kingdom of God. That is authentic experience. It does not detract from the authenticity of the proclamation that's committed to you. And Mark is stealing those Roman believers to hold out the message of God's kingdom to lost people around them in the teeth of people being offended by them. By themselves. Offended at them. And he's encouraging us to go on holding that gospel out still. You know how it is. There are folks that you feel you cannot share Christ with because they've seen something about you you're embarrassed about. Now, in Jesus' case and condition, of course, these people saying these things, they're wrong about Jesus, but they might well be right about us. We know what we ought to be. But that's the point of what we're saying, isn't it? That is authentic gospel message Christianity stuff. That's the message. We're not. Won't they have it? Well, the truth that remains present is this, the kingdom of God is at hand and they're going to have to deal with that whether we are a rough lot or not. And sinful and acceptable people like us need to repent and trust the Christ who's empowered to save sinners, who follow him, who will live in his kingdom, become fishers of men, serving the kingdom of God as imperfect, sinful human beings. And as we do that, there will be people whose moral and intellectual choice is to reject the proclamation of Christ's kingdom because they take offence at the message, well, yes, of course, but also because they take offence at us. <laughs> but you haven't heard that preach before, have you? <laughs> what's here? What's, what's the word saying? They take offence at Jesus, they take offence at his gospel because of him. And as they do so, we must not be deterred from following this Jesus as fishers of men for him. Tough, isn't it? It's quite hard. They took offence at him and then Jesus said to them, this is verse 4 now, here's the principle, a prophet is not without honour except in his home town and among his relatives and in his own house. And the day there was a picture of me on the mantelpiece as a young believer in my donkey jacket. Do you remember them? Preaching on the streets of Oxford on May morning to big crowds and my sketchboard out and you know, evangelising the lost, <laughs> the way you do. And, uh, and my auntie saw it and said to my widowed mother, aren't you ashamed of your son? They will take offence at you and you hold the gospel out to them still. Because yes, there are things in us that are offensive and there are things in us that are not right and are not perfect. But Jesus has to do with us still. And that's called grace and that's what it's all about. Does that make sense? I'll cut the rest of it. The prophet is with honour. Except in his... happened again <laughs> all the Greeks got up with the English hasn't okay uh, except in his own um, uh, patridi his patria his native country his native country in his own fatherland in his own country the prophet is without honor in his own native place the prophet is without honor in his home singoneto his own uh, genetic inheritance, his kin, people who's related to by blood. Amongst them, he's without honour. In his own oikos, his own house, his own home, prophet is without honour. 
right up and personal. It is axiomatic. Jesus is almost using a proverb. Maybe it is a proverb in his day and time and we've lost it. It is axiomatic that the prophet will lack honour right up that close. Because the message that he has is that he is the imperfect human being that you will find him to be. And they took offence at him. Do you want to be amongst those people who can't live by faith through that sort of experience? Do you want to be amongst the sort of people who can't go on following Jesus and holding out this gospel in the midst of that sort of experience? Because Mark is writing to these people in Rome and saying, don't be the sort of person who can't live by faith through that experience. Interesting, isn't it? And the fruit of this unbelief from these people, the, the response he gets from these folks, these people who think they know him well, he was not able to do a miracle there. Except to lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them, and he was amazed because of their unbelief. Wouldn't you and I love to be in a situation this morning where a few sick people came in and went, wow, we'd think that was brilliant if they were healed, wouldn't we? That would be amazing. That would be a big result. Oh, he just did a few miracles there. Jesus, after all. But the point that's being made is the opposite one. Not what Jesus could do, but what he was hindered in. Jesus works with people. He, 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 he can do stuff with people who come to him. <laughs>